Welcome everyone uh, to the Planning and Strategic Initiative Committee. Uh, we have two fairly uh, heavy topics to discuss, but we'll start off with the uh, comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw Crosby for component B of its first draft. And uh, we'll begin that with uh, a small staff presentation. So Ms. Goss, if you, if you want to start, if you can key in, thank you. Uh, before we actually start, um, any uh, pecuniary interest? Yeah, I, I want to declare pecuniary interest on the certain sections. So sections from four, five, six, seven, because I have property, I may be under the process. Okay, those conflicts have been noted. Um, although this document is, I think, appropriately interest at large, but specifically if you are under application, that's uh, appropriate to do so. Uh, so, Natalie. Back to you. Thank you. This afternoon we're tabling a 147 page report containing several sections of a new zoning bylaw. Given its lengths and um, breadth of topics that a zoning bylaw covers, we thought we would give a short presentation to highlight some of the key elements of what we're tabling this year in component B of a first draft. This slide shows the <coughs> process that we're following to table different sections of a comprehensive new zoning bylaw. In this staff report, we are tabling new zones for our urban growth center, and these zones replace our existing downtown zones. We're also tabling a new major infrastructure and utility zone, updated parking regulations, and some transition provisions. As you may recall, last year we released component A, of a new zoning bylaw, and with that, we held several opportunities for public consultation as part of the first draft. We'll do a similar process to that this year over the next three months. So to give a little bit of uh, highlights of the topics that are covered in this first draft this year, first is our new urban growth center zones. They apply to the geographic area of our downtown. They're titled the Urban Growth Center Zones because the Urban Growth Center is an intensification area that was established by the province in our provincial growth plan. So that's where the terminology comes from. These zones, and there's four of them that we're introducing through this first draft, cover approximately 480 properties in the downtown. You can see that on the map here. Uh, also in your agenda package, you can find that same map on page number 137. The major differences between our existing downtown zones and these new urban growth center zones is that these zones introduce residential uses across the downtown. And they also introduce regulations that relate to the built form to try to achieve a more pedestrian-oriented scale of a built form. So examples of those types of regulations include minimum and maximum uh, building podium heights and step backs to taller or from taller buildings. Together with these urban growth center zones, we're also tabling bonus regulations. Our existing zoning bylaw does contain bonus regulations in our general provisions section. What we intend to do through this first draft is make several improvements to those existing bonus regulations. <coughs> first off, development must meet some pre-qualifiers. For example, development must ensure that it's compatible to the, to the surrounding neighborhood. In addition, the new regulations establish a maximum FSR that you can bonus up to, and that would be up to a maximum of six. You can achieve that through bonusing without going through a zone change or official plan amendment application. The first draft bonus regulations also include, all the, include details on what are eligible community benefits and the equivalent bonus value that you can achieve if you provide those community benefits. Another major section that we're tabling this year is updated parking regulations. And I'll highlight three important things for you to notice once you start reading the details of the new zoning bylaw. First, you'll notice that there's reduced parking minimums. So we had a review of our existing parking rates done by Paradigm Transportation Solutions, which is a consultant that we retained a couple of years ago. And they looked at our rates together with looking at specific sites throughout the city of Kitchener 
And they also looked at other municipalities and their zoning rates as well for parking. Um, and we consulted with our transportation services division as well. And we're able to come up with some reduced minimum parking rates. And these rates vary by geography. So you can see on this slide, and you can see also in the new zoning bylaw, that there's a table that consolidates all of the parking regulations. And it shows them by UGC zones, or whether you're within a parts area, within a mixed use zone, and then all other areas of the city. We're also introducing the concept of parking maximums within the zoning bylaw. And those parking maximums, there's a range of parking maximums, and they also vary by geography. Something else that's new in this parking regulation is minimum parking rates for bicycles, as well as minimum parking rates for electric vehicles. A couple of other new additional items is we're introducing a new zone that doesn't currently exist in our zoning bylaw called the Major Infrastructure and Utility Zone, and it'll apply to approximately 15 properties across the city that are all publicly owned. Um, typically, these properties contain large-scale infrastructure, such as a hydro substation. The other unique thing that we're doing in our zoning bylaw first draft is introducing provisions that we're calling them transition provisions. And what they do is they would allow for the continued processing of development applications that are in progress right now today to continue to be processed under our existing zoning bylaw for a specified period of time. What this does is it allows the development applications that are in process to kind of finish off with the rules that they've started under, which is something that we see as fair and equ equitable. Everyone involved in this project, one thing that's key for us is obtaining input early in the process. We feel that this provides greater opportunity to share ideas collectively and reach any necessary compromises well in advance of, of asking council to make any decisions on a new zoning bylaw. So similar to what we did last year, we notified property owners with a customized letter, and in that letter, each individual property owner was informed of their existing zoning as well as their proposed zoning and opportunities for public input. So we're doing the same this year, and we'll be mailing out letters this week to approximately 500 property owners that are affected by the zones introduced to you today. And there'll be multiple opportunities for public and stakeholder input over the next three months. We'll hold two drop-in sessions with staff presentations. There'll be multiple stakeholder sessions. We'll have a topic-specific session on parking regulations and another one on our urban growth center zones as well as our bonus regulations. And we'll also be utilizing Engage Kitchener. So there's the recommendation that's in the staff report today. And that concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. OK. Well, it is a fairly lengthy document, so I'm sure um, uh, we'll be flexible with the time questions. Uh, Councillor Fernandez, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off with a few questions and then maybe some others will come in too. Um, so the, the first thing I wanted to ask you, um, Natalie, was about the, uh, and I don't think it was a holding provision, but it was a holding around the, zone, the existing zoning for um, applications that are presently in. Have you set a sunset on, on that when, that's, when they'll actually have to transfer over to the new zoning bylaws? So through the chair, my understanding is you're referring to the transition provisions? Yes, thank you. Um, so I can clarify that I think it's section 19 of the draft new zoning bylaw contains the details about what complete development applications would be able to take advantage of those transition provisions. Um, and what it does is it would allow for three years for those development applications to continue to be processed under zoning bylaw 85-1. And that would be three years from the effective date of the new zoning bylaw. So the date that council adopts the new zoning bylaw would be the effective date. And then three years from that date, applicants would have a chance to finish off the applications that they've started. By introducing it now as part of a first draft, we're kind of giving um, development applications or developers a heads up that we do intend to put kind of a cutoff date in terms of when they can take advantage of the existing zoning rules that are in place. Right, so, I mean, council may not approve this until another year from now, right? So essentially, 
the development industry has four years starting right now. Do you anticipate a sudden influx of applications to try and sort of get in under the radar? Or uh, the, under the new policies, probably is better wording. Uh, through the chair, we've, we've actually taken a look at the status of all of our current development applications, and there's not that many that would need to take advantage. Um, you would only need to take advantage of a transition provision if you can't comply with the new zoning bylaw. But as you can see from what we've tabled last year and this year, there's a lot of good things in there that a lot of applicants would like to take advantage of going forward. So it would actually be in their interest to comply with the new zoning bylaw. Right, okay. Um, I certainly want to compliment you on the, um, the bicycle room and, 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 and at seeing that added in in a number of areas actually um, with the zoning. I think that's really important. It's looking f certainly forward. Um, after Bike Fest yesterday, I mean, maybe we didn't have thousands of people, but the, uh, the, the message was we're going in the right direction. Lots of people said that to me, and we want to see, our, see ourselves as a, a city who embraces cycling and the cycling uh, infrastructure that we need. And that's really critical, I think. The uh, one question I did have was, now, our, my pages are numbered a little, I don't know, oddly, I guess. I, I'm sure everybody is. Section 5, page 6 of 25. And that was uh, the page that talks about driveway widths and lot line setbacks, which is on page 5 of, of, of 25. Did you find it? Yeah, okay. Uh, you probably know the document inside out. Um, <laughs> one of the questions I had was re with regards to the widths of driveways, and we have an ongoing problem in the Conestoga College area about widening of driveways. Is this going to be a more stringent measure that we will be able to enforce around expansion of driveways? So through the chair, I'm going to let Lauren answer those questions. She played a significant role in uh, writing these regulations. Lauren. Thank you. Through the chair, staff did review the driveway regulations that were contained in the existing zoning bylaw 85-1 and have flagged these for further review again at the time that the residential zoning will be tabled in the future. And the reason for doing that is so that we can look comprehensively at the driveway widths and driveway ride widening regulations together with the residential lot standards. Okay. Uh, as a second point too, with um, respect to the driveway widening and on-street parking, uh, the working team identified that critical land areas to actually regulate the, the balance between those two things is in fact the city-owned boulevard between a street and a lot. And the curb cuts that may be provided there giving access to driveways is maybe a best uh, tool to use. However, the zoning bylaw actually regulates the standards on the property rather than in the city's boulevard or the city's right of way. And so potentially a, a future process may be a best way to deal with that. Thank you. Okay. I think I, I, think I get where you're going, Lauren. Um, because what, what I'm hearing is, is the zoning doesn't a apply to the bylaws related to parking on sort of the, the, 15, the first 15 uh, feet of, of any driveway because that's the road right of way. Through the chair, yes. The, yeah. the roadway right of way would not be included okay. in the so, zoning but what, what I'm seeing is where the property expands from a double uh, driveway uh, and it's because they've added additional um, occupants to that because it's a rental property and it was originally a single ho house. Now, more than 50% of that frontage is driveway. So does it, this zoning bylaw speak to that? So through the chair, staff are more than happy to entertain further conversations on this topic throughout the public consultation period. And I'll just reiterate that it is the very beginning of a process and we're starting to think about these ideas now. Okay. But again, that could be something that's looked at and <coughs> reviewed again at the time of the residential zones. Okay. Thank you. Am I out of time? You are. Okay. Um, you can keep back in. Back. Yep. Yep. Uh, just for the benefit of the committee as I go to others with questions, can you just quickly outline 
the time period. So this is the first review, then it would be going to public consultation and stakeholder, and then just kind of the steps that are, that are part of the, finally when council would ratify this. Sure. Um, today marks the start of consultation on the first draft, and throughout June we'll be holding two public drop-in sessions, two stakeholder sessions, as well as a week of stakeholder interviews with any, any stakeholder that wishes to have some one-on-one -on -one time with staff. The commenting deadline as outlined in the staff report is, uh, doesn't expire until August 26th, and that's just on the first draft. So what, what we've learned from last year, the process of tabling a first draft of component A last year, is that the process is going to be iterative. Once we have comments from whoever wishes to comment, property owners, stakeholders, and whatnot, we take quite a significant amount of time to review those comments to make sure that um, we're giving everyone our, our due attention. What we intend to do is follow up individually with each person who made comments as part of the first draft, have some further dialogue on that. And then once we try to achieve as much consensus as possible with each property owner, each commenter, only then would we table a final draft before council. The final draft would then represent another round of consultation, which would be a statutory public meeting, as well as any other necessary follow-up stemming from that. After that, we would take a final bylaw back to you. And at that point, it might be an entire new zoning bylaw, not just components. It might be the entire package that we ask you to make a decision of. We anticipate that most likely the earliest you would receive that to make a decision is probably within the next two years. It's contingent upon our new official plan. Okay, thank you. I think that's helpful. Mayor Rabenowitz. Thank you very much. Um, and first of all, thank you uh, to staff for all the uh, the work on uh, getting this to to this point. I wanted to, in particular, focus on um, the whole section on bonusing, and perhaps ask staff to uh, take us through it, uh, particularly. You know what's what's and highlight what's what's new, uh, because I think this is a significant change, but also something that's quite um, progressive. But at the same time, I also you know think it's important that we articulate uh, how is this going to address some of the concerns we heard uh, from folks a couple weeks ago as we were dealing with another process, and we said this would be this would be where we are where we're addressing those issues. Through the chair, maybe I'll take a uh, uh, take some time to do a summary of bonusing. And really, what this is is we're looking at a certain approach in downtown where we're trying to obviously create a great place to live, work, and play. And there are a lot of aspects of our economic development strategy and planning that go hand in hand. And so, to create and implement that vision for the downtown area, what we've looked at is an approach to the new downtown zoning, which includes a certain uh, application of uses, land uses, and regulations. And where we're going with bonus regulations is something that could, as the mayor's indicated, set us apart from pretty much every other city in Ontario that does bonusing. And it's the way that our, our planning forefathers and foremothers have actually set it up, is that Bonusing regulations would be as of right in the zoning bylaw. And there would be a predetermined menu or list of community benefits. In fact, we've listed 18 of them that a development proponent could select from. And there would also be predetermined bonus values in the zoning bylaw. And so if they were wanting to do added built form or added density beyond the official plan allows a floor space ratio of three times the lot coverage, but you can bonus above that. A landowner could potentially achieve a doubling of that floor space ratio in the downtown. It's been identified as a very desirable place. It's our primary intensification area. We've heard delegations and the mayor referred to that from the part central meetings that we have a multimodal hub that's, that's, uh, that's coming in the future. Uh, we're looking at so many different things within the innovation district and what might happen in terms of 
hopefully high-speed rail, two-way go. <coughs> it is the place to grow. It's the place to grow up <coughs> and to go higher. But if we're going to go up and higher with more density, that it needs to benefit the community downtown and around the downtown. And we heard that from some of the delegations, the public delegations that came out at the Part Central meeting as well. It's not just density for the sake of density, they said. It has to benefit people. And so if you look at the list <coughs> that we have, and it starts on page 1-53, uh, I believe, the bonusing provisions have some precursor stuff on 1-52, which talks about when bonusing applies and when you know, it has to be suitable and the infrastructure has to be there. But there's a chart that starts on that page, 1-53. You have a different number. Page 5 of 22 within section 4. So on page 5 of 22 in section 4, there's a chart that we're putting forward, and it's very important that at this point in time, the public, the community, and the development industry and council consider this list. Now is the time when we will be doing robust engagement. If we all can come to uh, a similar agreement and get on the same page that these are community benefits, that having improved buildings with energy, water, and waste conservation, enhanced transportation demand management, that might provide additional public space, civic space for placemaking, if you keep looking on the flipping the pages, additional public parking, renewable or energy systems, cultural heritage conservation, affordable <coughs> housing is a very important one as well that you would see within this list that someone could bonus for. Of course, residential downtown, that's our primary objective that we have from our growth management strategy, official plan, downtown action plan, along with public art. We propose two things different than what's in the official plan. So we would require an amendment to do this. They are the last two within that chart on page eight. We think they're quite important for downtown to achieve our vision. One of them is food store. If a proponent was providing a food store within their development, they could qualify for bonusing. The other is architectural excellence. And I think this council's added something onto the business plan to look at this. Is there any incentives we can have to achieve great architecture downtown? And we're hearing that a lot from our own industry as well. And so if we can take strive to achieve this kind of approach, this would really set us apart from how Toronto does it, how other places do it. To be honest, they're in a little bit more of a let's make a deal situation, some have referred to it. I don't know if it's quite that far, but it can be a cumbersome process that requires a lengthy zone change application. You never know when you're getting into it. It's not very predictable. You don't know what the benefit might be. You don't know is the building going to end up being 50 stories or 60 stories. You don't know. Whereas our approach, you generally would know. You would know what is within the bounds, what is in the possible footprint this could be, and you would know what the community benefits are. The other thing is the way that we've structured it is a proponent couldn't do just one community benefit to achieve a really high density. The more density they want, the more community benefits you would have to do. So in theory, to at least look at a bonus, a, a doubling of the FSR through bonusing, you'd have to do at least three of these community benefits. And so far, we think that's fair, and that's how some of the values have been put out there. The other part is that this isn't really based on an appraisal system as well. There's a lot of nitty-gritty uh, technical details that can hamstring some municipalities that deal with this. So we think this is more beneficial to all involved in the process. It could be a very streamlined process, time-saving for everybody involved in this process, major negotiating savings. We do have to supplement it with an implementation guideline that we're working on, and Cameron's here uh, at the table today. He's helping me out with, with doing that. So we got to get a little more into the details of the process and how it works, and we're going to work with our industry and the public on that. But it's quite important, because this could give us a big competitive advantage. Waterloo doesn't do it. Other places don't do it. 
this could be the making and Kitchener approach. So <clears throat> just so we're clear then, what you're saying is if in the downtown right now, properties can do a, a, a 3.0, they can increase it up to another 3.0, which in effect doubles it. But that's, that's then the highest they can go. So essentially, it would, if you had full lot coverage, you would go from three stories to six stories. Through the chair, that's correct. That's what in the first draft we thought was a reasonable limit, and that kind of follows our direction from the official plan. We kind of felt anything beyond that really should have a little bit more technical study and probably should have a public process and that would on okay, a site-specific so, basis. So, so in other words, we would still consider the other things, but it would go through a, a public process. Through the chair, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. I, I, Mr. I, I Mayor, Mr. Mayor, before you carry, uh, I just want to let uh, Mr. May add some clarification. Uh, too many people are... Go ahead, try Yeah, again. through you, Mr. Chair. You may have just got the clarification, but I want to be really clear on this point. Um, somebody could get a uh, uh, SF, FSR of six as of right, uh, but they could still go higher than that through uh, through a development application. Right. Okay. So, Mayor, do you have uh, like another question? For quite a few. Or, just uh, one, one more quick one um, on Section five point nine, uh, electric vehicle parking space provisions. Glad to see this in here. I think it's important and certainly part of the, uh, the direction we need to be going. Um, so is this just a parking space or would it actually require them to have the apparatus in place as well as part of the process? Through the chair, it would be to make it electric vehicle ready. Okay. So I think we're looking at the infrastructure for it. The technology, as you as you know, is is changing quite often. Right. So, so then they then the the say it's a condo, then they could choose to install or sign it at the right time. I, I guess what I'm getting at is how do we sort of take it one more step potentially, and actually require them to have spaces with the equipment available to, you know, and, and they can charge for it and so on. But the the point being that it's actually there and and not just they're in theory, but they're in actuality. So through the chair, the way that this first draft is structured is that for essentially commercial uses or non-residential uses, the spaces would have to be available with all of the infrastructure. So the conduit there and the charging station there oh, okay. so that you can drive up to a store and plug in. Okay. For a residential use, it would just be what we're terming um, electric vehicle ready, meaning the conduit and everything has to be there, but then if a, a purchaser of a particular unit actually has an electric vehicle, all they would need to do is supply the charging station so that the expensive part is done for them. The infrastructure's there. It was built when the building was built. They would just have to supply the charging station, which is only about approximately $2,000. So the expense is far less than actually having to put the conduit in place. Right. Okay. And, <laughs> and I guess at some point we might look at this whole issue of fast charging versus regular charging and so on as part of the criteria? Through the chair, that's correct. We okay. wanted to introduce the concept at this point and see what kind of feedback we get. Okay, great, thank you. Councilor Asington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to, uh, to our planners, could someone just elaborate and explain a little more on, on that bonusing provision in relation to affordable housing. If I'm a developer and I come to you and say I want, for example, 50% of my units to be affordable housing, can you explain the bonus I would get? Just with a little detail. Maybe throw in the explanation of the dollar figures there for regional affordable housing. I'm on section four, page seven of 22. Through the chair, we would have to confirm that the development would actually have units that meet the definition of affordable that's used within our region. And if so, then the, if the maximum floor space ratio for their site is 3.0, if they're proposing to do 50% of those units that meet that definition, the maximum floor space ratio would be 4.0 because they have a bonus value of an extra one is indicated in that chart. If they do more, higher bonus value, less, lower bonus value. 
what we put forward, and this is still for discussion uh, within our community and others and, and possibly with the region, is that we find it's not always possible on every single site and every development to do units that are affordable, but there may be an interest in that developer to see that happen somewhere. And so we're, we put forward this possibility of what if they contributed towards the construction of affordable housing units that's maybe done through the regional program or maybe it's through something that the city has more control of. And so that's where the financials are, are proposed. Councilor Marsh. Uh, just to follow up on that question about the definition of uh, some of these bonusing uh, provisions, I, I'm taking it that, is it true that you will then be bringing forward, uh, you know, uh, more precise definitions of each of those things? And for example, affordable housing, uh, you, you referenced a, a, an agreed upon uh, definition, but for how long would the developer have to provide affordable housing for it to be bonused? You know, would we have definitions like that? Uh, through the chair, yes. Um, further detail on each uh, identified community benefit will be uh, elaborated and provided in the implementation guidelines. Um, for the affordable housing, non-market um, housing uh, section, that will actually be quite extensive, and there will be detail here on um, uh, the uh, the tenureship of the of the unit as well as the uh, uh, the management of the unit because it will likely will be the region or a non profit provider that will be managing the unit and then it will also be specified as to the uh, rent per month as well as the uh, length uh, duration of time um, that that's provided great and then uh, you mentioned also that uh, the the bonusing provisions are an as of right uh, within the scope of the uh, the list here, but wouldn't we have a public process anyway with a site plan review of uh, a large development regardless? Through the chair, site plan processes are not under the Planning Act a public process that okay. members of the public are directly involved in terms of any appeal rights. And so the time would be now as part of this zoning bylaw. That would be under the Planning Act, the official public process to consider this topic and if these are the appropriate things and values. And the, uh, sorry, the bonus thing would really impact the density as opposed to how the property would sit on the lot, which would specify to the, the site plan process. Okay. It's more about density. Bonus is more related to density. I guess all I'm asking is uh, if I can just reframe the question. Uh, when a develop uh, once this is all approved and ready to ready to roll, a developer wants to uh, do a project within the, the the downtown core. If it's a large scale project, will they will there be? Uh, but it's within the scope of of what's already defined here. Will there still be a public process? through the chair, if they would comply with the parameters that are in the zoning, then there would not be any further public process. The public process is deemed to be the official plan and the zoning bylaw. And so just like anywhere in the city, if someone yep. is doing a development that complies with zoning, they just go through a site plan process, not necessarily a public process. What we're talking about, and council may remember, on the 16th, we talk about the REN study, and maybe there are other ways we could inform people through either some kind of notification, whether it's online or on the actual property itself, mm -hmm. that, hey, this property may be developed shortly before they start to see construction <coughs> vehicles rolling. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davy. Thank you. I just want to use a specific example. I'm looking at uh, I guess page 7 of 22. So, for example, so they start at 3, and I'm looking specifically at the first one, affordable housing. And looking at the very bottom, it says contribution of funds towards city or region affordable housing programs. So they could, in theory, contribute, write a check for $250,000, and their floor space ratio goes from 3 to 4.5. Through the chair, that's generally correct, yes. Okay. Councilor Fernandez. Yeah, I wanted to go to um, page, uh, in section four, page 15 of 22, 
Uh, it talks about the, lo the location of lodging houses. Um, through these letters that you're now sending out, do you anticipate connecting with um, rental housing proponents specifically around the, the college area? Through the chair, just, just point of clarification on these ones. Highlighted regulations in the zoning bylaw, there's a footnote there that says we're continuing to review those. So mm -hmm. those are existing regulations in the zoning bylaw that we still need to review. Yeah, I did understand that. Okay. okay. To answer your question further, we would anticipate to notify all property owners throughout the city in the same way. So same way as we have been doing. Mm -hmm. Once the properties are up for proposed zone changes as part of this comprehensive process, the property owners would be notified. If there's other interest groups that wish to be notified of this comprehensive process, they can contact us at any time and we'll add them to our mailing list and make sure that they're notified of the process. Okay. I mean, I, my understanding was that uh, um, we had a meeting not that long ago with Bylaw and, and um, Alain can correct me if I'm wrong, planning was in attendance as well uh, uh, with some of the landlords and uh, I think it was Della Ross actually that was there and that was one of the conversations that they were having and one of the um, asks from the landlords was the ability to be participating in this zoning so I don't know if that information was transferred to you guys or not you, you're having a puzzled look so maybe no, not through, no through the chair yes Okay. We have been passed along that information, and people who are in attendance at that meeting that requested to be notified have already been added to our mailing list, okay. and I'm sure more will be added once we get to the residential zones. Okay. So you've, um, you've already completed the first flush, which was all the natural areas and all the natural zoning, so now we're moving to another completely different section. And um, Okay, that's great. Do you anticipate the same kind of response that you had, I mean, uh, it was quite a substantial response from the natural areas and, and that, that, that rezoning and that remapping for this section? Through the chair, um, that would assume we expected that response last yeah, year, <laughs> um, which was quite a surprise to us, but nonetheless, because it's early in the process, it was greatly appreciated to have that, what we're kind of describing as an overwhelming response. Um, this year, because of the scope of the number of properties that we're notifying, so last year it was approximately 2,200, and this year it's 500. No, I wouldn't expect yeah. the same turnout. That being said, some of the topics um, are citywide, so the parking regulations do apply citywide, so we could see um, some level of interest okay. in that as well. Okay, <coughs> great. Okay, thank you. Councillor Marsh? Oh, I have... Uh, I, I'd like to move the recommendation uh, at the appropriate time. Okay, I'll come back to you. Uh, there's no other questions of staff. Um, I have, so as a document, once this is ratified, uh, how, uh, what, what's really the life cycle of this, this document? Uh, 20 year, when would we review this back again? The Planning Act mandates that we do a review every five to ten years, um, given the Planning Act, which Planning Act is in effect at the time. So right now we're mandated to review it every five years. We do an annual review um, currently with our zoning bylaw. So you see that as as comprehensive as not as comprehensive. No, as more um, to do with administrative updates. Um, we typically do a, compre a comprehensive review, as you can see, approximately about every 10 to 20 years. 10 to 20 years. Yeah. So, and that's where I was leading. Um, related more to our parking, and um, I was glad to see electric vehicle, EV vehicles, charging is a component of it. How do we address that with development? Um, and especially when we're thinking even just in the f next five year, where we will probably start seeing... Uh, consumer usage of autonomous vehicles, even if you look at a 10-year cycle, if you're overly conservative, that may still be well within the defined, you know, s still in a shorter period than when we, we, we would be revisiting it on a more larger comprehensive aspect of how do we take into account. So when I, mentioned, when I referenced autonomous vehicles, you know, we already have ride sharing right now. Of course, the uptake on that is still slow. But imagine, you know, just cars everywhere. They could be, you know, a community asset where people can just, you know, co-share rather than each individual owning uh, a vehicle fully. 
I read a report recently where it said 95% of the time the, the vehicle is just parked. It's only 5% of its life cycle that it's ever being used. Uh, and I think that's probably more of a, a optimistic uh, consideration. Are we forward thinking enough, taking that into account? I would suggest that yes, we are, through the introduction of parking maximums, through the introduction of electric vehicle parking, as well as our shared parking that's, that's in this draft as well. Yeah. So we currently have shared parking rates, such as a plaza complex rate in our existing zoning bylaw. But when you delve into the details of this first draft, you'll see a new shared parking table um, that does account for the exact kind of situation you're talking about where you know, vehicles are, aren't really driven that much and they're essentially parked. So a shared parking situation would allow parking spaces to be shared amongst residential uses um, and then other types of non-residential uses because their peak times are at different periods of the day. So right. it's, it's less parking that needs to actually be built. Okay, good. Thank you. That's great. Um, there are no other questions, and uh, Councillor Marsh has suggested she wants to move this. Um, if there are no comments, I will take the vote. Do you want, did you want to make a comment, Councillor Marsh? Or? Okay. No, you don't have to. I, you were reaching, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to congratulate staff on an incredibly thorough job. Uh, this is, a, this is a, quite a body of work, and we wish you well on all of your public consultations to come. What a summer, summertime project. Uh, so we'll look forward to hearing back all the feedback uh, from you in the fall. Mayor Venvik. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what I said earlier. There's, uh, this has been a, a huge volume of work um, to get us to this point, um, but I think it also reflects a lot of the kinds of things that, um, you know, certainly previously in my role as, as a ward councillor, and I think uh, other ward councillors around the horseshoe have heard at different points in time in, in terms of issues and concerns that uh, uh, that folks have had, and. and uh, tries to address them. Without a doubt, I'm, there's probably going to be some things that people still think should uh, should happen uh, or, or shouldn't happen, and we'll hear that through the uh, the public uh, engagement process. But there there is a lot of uh, new thinking and innovative thinking in this, which is, uh, I think, uh, very exciting. And I look forward to uh, seeing about the kind of response we're going to get going uh, going forward, especially you know, and even even things like. Uh, I, I see some of the, the new things that we've inc recently included in the past or, or new ones that we're looking at, like biotechnological establishments, brew pubs, uh, all that kind of thing that I know uh, has created some, some challenges um, and really you would think should be more straightforward and now in the future will be, so, or hopefully will be once we ratify this uh, in the future. So uh, with that, uh, I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll just to quickly take a, a moment to thank staff as well. It's uh, you, you know a great body of work that uh, uh, an undertaking on, on staff's behalf to even bring us to this point. But it is very clear to see that uh, something like this uh, requires for it to be percolated through a lot of filters before we get uh, you know the high quality brew. Uh, I, I think it's, it al already looks quite refined uh, and seeing uh, a very proactive forward approach to planning and ensuring that our city does grow in the right and more smart city uh, component. And I think that's, uh, that, that needs to be a strong consideration which this document already start, has started to capture that and uh, I only look forward to the additional revisions of it. So with that, I will ask... Uh, the call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Thank you. Thank you, staff. All right, so we'll move on to uh, item number two, process for community engagement, use of 48 Ontario Street North. So carrying on the theme of forward thinking, so I'll have staff uh, present uh, and then we can engage in questions. Councillor Ioannidis? Oh, okay. 
get keyed in. So Sylvia, whenever you're ready. I think so. Okay. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, some direction from Council to proceed with community engagement. And in this case, we're looking at the range of options for the future of the building at uh, 48 Ontario Street North, which is owned by the city, a heritage listed property. And uh, the, the convergence between that particular building being vacant since 2001 has been of great interest both to the heritage community and the community at large in downtown Vitality. And that's converged with an interest from the arts community that uh, there is a, a distinct need for a space that is affordable in uh, various aspects from creative industries, filmmaking, music, uh, performance, rehearsal, visual arts, studio space, going as far back as uh, Culture Plan 2. So that convergence has led us to this proposal before you today to consider uh, the needs that the local community have expressed. Specifically, we have uh, in the region, just to give you a scope, as in the report, identifies that we have about 10,000 uh, people who are in the labor force for the purposes of arts and cultural industries, creative industries. Um, in the traditional sense, as a matter of fact, across Canada, just artists that you would consider traditional, such as musician or dancer, or filmmaker, or author, that particular group of nine occupations recognized by Revenue Canada is uh, greater than the labor force involved in the auto sector. So it's a significant uh, force of employment in and of itself. If you expand that to include cultural workers and creative industries, graphic designers and architects, we're up to about 10,000 in this community, or 3.3% of the labor force. That specific group has also demonstrated to be very highly entrepreneurial. In fact, across the labor force, approximately 8% uh, are actually engaged in self-employment and in the arts and creative industries that's actually at 21 percent so highly entrepreneurial expressing needs for those kinds of services as well and Emily and I are going to co-present uh, just to give you a quick overview so that we can get to uh, a few questions um, to start off with we're looking at an, a range of options in the report and for that I'll just spaces that you see here. We're looking at a way to study this first with the community to see if it makes sense because it may not be the right option. Hence option one, to sell the building. Uh, in each case, the options are being developed to determine criteria for an RFP process that council would then uh, direct to go ahead uh, potentially at the end of 2016 with all of that feedback to aid in the decision. And I guess to give you an overview of that feedback, I'll turn it over to Emily on the community engagement process. That's right, thank you. So we've heard a lot from the arts, culture, and creative industries community, as Sylvia says, dating back to Culture Plan 1, which is in 1996. And really the need for affordable creation space, affordable rehearsal, performance, and exhibition space, as well as shared spaces for, class, for teaching classes, for meeting rooms, um, as well as the need for entrepreneurial services have been articulated reaching back that far. And some of the recent um, and, uh, consultation data that we've been looking at, we went back to Culture Plan 1 and 2. There was also work done by the Creative Enterprise Initiative, also Creative Enterprise Enabling Organization, that looked at the need for space and actually delivered some programming in Waterloo on affordable studio spaces. We also looked at um, information that's come from Arts Reboot, Arts Together, which is a community-led initiative that was really interested in discussing the current state of arts and culture in Waterloo Region. And they've identified some of the same things as we see from the Culture Plan 1 and 2 from 1996. 
More recently, some of these same things came out again in the Make It Kitchener consultation process, and this is where the idea of a creative hub or art hub has come, come forth because that was articulated in um, the strategy moving forward. So our intention with the consultation process for 48 Ontario Street North is to not repeat the processes and ask the same questions that have already been answered many, many times, but to look at how we move this conversation forward. So to that end, in uh, June, July, and August, what we are hoping to do is provide tours of the building at 48 Ontario Street North to get people familiar with that space. That will be available to stakeholder groups, such as the advisory committees, but then also to the public. In September and October will be the bulk of our consultation. The building will be open for doors open at the beginning of the fall. And then we are proposing to do stakeholder labs that will look at the needs that have been articulated by the arts and culture community, um, as well as the creative industries, and prioritizing those needs and how they might be met in the building at 48 Ontario Street North. Once these needs have been prioritized, we'll do charrettes to help develop models that will look at how these needs could specifically be met in the building. This will also look at potential governance models, operational models, including some high-level financial analysis. These will then be refined, um, including some further financial assessment, and then brought back to the community through a World Cafe process where they'll be able to to express their preferred models. This will also be um, available on Engage Kitchener. So the whole point is to come up with a model that is supported by the stakeholders that can then come back to um, council and the advisory committees um, both in November and December and we hope with the final report back to um, council at the beginning of 2017. So our whole point in this process is to really listen to the community, build on what we've already heard from them, and think about how, if, if, how and if 48 Ontario Street North could be operationalized as a hub for arts and culture. which uh, shows the range of options on the screen and in the report. Um, as, uh, as it states in the recommendation, this is really about the engagement. And to start the conversation, there are three options laid out. They kind of cover the spectrum. In fact, in discussion with the advisory committees, these options kind of emerge as uh, some of the things that uh, could happen. One is that the uh, criteria be developed and an RFP put forward to the sale of the building, um, and that would include some of the features and characteristics that might be pre preserved as part of the heritage uh, listed nature of the building. Uh, then that the proceeds from that sale be used for an arts hub in an alternate location that would be a, you know, a secondary process. The second option would be to develop criteria for an RFP to lease the building and that could be through the uh, workshopping with the community, develop criteria that would uh, create the absolute best possible proponent to come forward, including proponents who have the capacity to raise funds either through matching grants or through capital campaigns and to have that kind of capacity, just as an example of the criteria that may be developed. And the third option is a combination that exists in, uh, in very many other models as well with a private-public partnership in some way, that the building is sold, that a portion of it then be uh, used for the arts, and that the proceeds could uh, potentially contribute towards uh, the, the site itself being a place for the same kinds of activities for catalyst arts activities. Um, and that uh, concludes our presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, there are lots of questions from the committee, so we'll start off with uh, Councilor Galloway Seelock. Yeah, I have a few questions. I'm going to just start with the community engagement piece. Um, you've got a lot of great things there to engage what I would say more are stakeholders than the general community. Um, what's in your plan uh, to engage the general community versus stakeholders? Well, the, all of these. All of this will be open to the general public, and so we're hoping that the, the tours, for example, will be open for the general public. Um, doors open will be open. There will be folks with a particular interest in the charrettes in the World Cafe, but the, the whole thing will be open to the general public. 
I think there needs to be another piece in there that's either just a, a survey online to get the opinions of people who do either don't have the time to come to some of those, mm -hmm. but something that's more of a quick, dirty, I can give my opinion, but I don't have to spend a lot of time, so I really, is that is that included in there? Yes, yes. so we were okay. anticipating that would be part of the Engage Kitchener okay. portion. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to, to hear that. There's an assumption that you made on page um, 2 4 with regards should the city determine that the, the building be sold, that proceeds of the sales reserve, be reserved for an alternate arts hub. Where did that assumption come from? Uh, that assumption was developed uh, over time. I, I don't know if I can pinpoint the exact uh, source or not. We have uh, a way to. Uh, model the uh, reach the needs of the arts community while still having an opportunity to sell the building. I'm wondering if there's um, an opportunity to, I know it's all part of option number one, but ask that question separately um, and remove it from option one and, and ask it in, um, separately. I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily of the opinion that it shouldn't go to an arts hub, but I think that's a question that we need to ask to the community separately. Um, that should we sell the building? Should the, the funds go to an art hub, arts hub or should it go to something else? I think that's feedback yes. that I would want to hear from the community. So I'm not sure I'm okay with that okay. as an assumption being made right now. That's a good way we could take it, thank um, you. But still asking that question. Okay. I think the feedback you're gonna get is gonna tell you probably to do that, but I think it's an important mm -hmm. piece. I'm not sure if I'm just not reading these 100% correct, but is there an option here for the city to retain ownership of the building? And if, what option is that? Because I was thinking it might be option two, but I'm not 100% sure. Through the chair, that's true. It could be more clear that the city retain ownership and seek to lease the property would be option two. Yeah, I think we need to make that just a little bit um, right. clear especially for we're going to the community to ask for for the opinion because the way I look at it without that is that we're leasing releasing or we're selling like we're selling releasing or we're selling um, so I think that's important um, so just uh, clarifying saying retention of the property and develop the criteria for the RFP lease so Right, it's, yeah. yeah, just at the beginning, adding something that the city retains ownership right. while development of a criteria. To I agree. Lease. Yeah, sure. Um, so those are my questions. I can make comments, but I think that's been done mostly through my questions. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Chair Singh. So I'm prepared to move this recommendation at the appropriate time. Uh, a couple questions. So first of all, uh, I wonder if we could get the slide back that shows your timeline of your proposal for the community engagement. So I noticed that uh, in your description of what you'll be doing in September and October, that there's a shift in there from from uh, all the consultation through the summer, stakeholder labs, charrettes, and then my, I heard that you're going to then see what the community's preferred option is and steer towards honing that as you, in order to prepare to come forward to council. That's is that correct. Yeah, that's yeah. correct? So uh, could we add a step in there uh, just to share that feedback back to council as well? It, not necessarily in a, a email, you know, in a <coughs> formal report but in an email format so that we're in the loop about and all of councils in the loop about the, per, the preferred option and uh, so also is there any way that we can complete this process a little sooner it feels like uh, you know it's going to be a whole year before a, a decision is made about who's going to lead the next step uh, through the selection of an RFP proponent. Is there any way that we can complete the consultation earlier? Through the chair, yes. The reason we have it, the bulk of it in September and October is to hopefully catch people when they're not on summer vacation, which is why it's occurring in September and October. 
um, we could move the report back to council before the end of the year um, and maybe that would solve the, your query yeah I think that would that would help very much uh, you know we did just have a uh, a large report from planning and they're going to be completing all their consultations through the summer that might pose a challenge mm -hmm. you know community does uh, you know everybody goes on holiday one point or another uh, or most people do and so I can understand your hesitation to complete everything in the summer but it would be great if we could move this process along mm -hmm. quicker thank you Councilor Ioannidis thank you chair Singh um, Councillor Marsh touched upon the time frame a little bit and that was good to see that because I had concerns that it was a little too long, especially if we get to the RFP process. That could take even three or four months, even several months, so I have some concerns with that timeline. Um, but my one concern is given that we've had a ton of consultation, are we not going a little ahead of ourselves? Because what if the community goes, I want option one. So if we have option one, we really don't need to do any of the rest of that stuff. Th that's correct. Okay, so we the process would just stop? Is that what it is? Well, through the chair, I, we, uh, I think it's a really excellent suggestion that we check back in with council earlier in the process, and should that be emerging as the uh, preferred option then we could accelerate based on that and council could proceed with their decision um, I mean independent with consideration of that input though okay that's that's good to know I don't want it to go that way but mm -hmm. um, that's good to know because I don't I don't want to go through all this stuff and then we're not doing anything mm -hmm. okay thank you council Fernandez yeah thanks um, in consultation with uh, stakeholders and community members, I know that you're going to be taking a tour of the courtyard um, in the next week or so. Will that play into uh, knowing what that space has to offer, knowing what the registry has to offer? Will that play a part in how you project what happens with the region, with the Legion? Uh, through the chair, the uh, tour of the courtyard for us is coming up in a couple of weeks for some specific spaces that they've developed. And uh, the goal for the community consultation is not to duplicate necessarily what's out there in uh, specific uh, activities that are happening and particular price ranges. So this would be to complement whatever's happening in the community. Okay. And th this may be a bit premature yet, but... Um have you got a sense of, of where the stakeholders you've already engaged with? Because I see there are people sitting in the audience, obviously, who are very interested in this particular issue. Um, what their leaning is already is, have you, you, you must, I mean, this article has already come out in the media. Have you heard from people already on what their desire is for this property? Through the chair, we've heard some general uh, positive uh, feedback that something is moving forward, but uh, specific to uh, the options moving forward at this point, they, we've yet to engage the community fully. Okay. So, so should we end up with option two through the public engagement? Um, would the, the RFP include how that building would be managed and how that would be taken care of the facilities wise through the chair yes okay and my last question was um, if i look at the stakeholders uh, it says art organizations jm is jm drama included in that in through that group the, yes it is. okay great thank you mayor Vanovic. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for uh, bringing uh, this report forward. I think it uh, begins to address something we've been, we've been hearing about for some time, which is the, the need for uh, additional space um, in the community. I think one of the things that it, it doesn't deal with, and, and um, no doubt needs to be separate, is if we introduce a new building, um, and there's costs uh, and so on from an ongoing perspective associated with it, 
the funding for that and also how do we balance that against um, you know some of our existing uh, community assets that at times are also struggling and so you know we're gonna have to balance that out at some point in the decision-making process but uh, there's there's no doubt in my mind that uh, uh, there's a lot to be gained uh, through a, of a potential hub and, and I think you're getting at a number of the uh, the issues I'm, I'm wondering though um, if somewhere through all this you actually and, and maybe this is where your charrettes and so on start coming in but where you start looking at a or in getting the input for a hub that isn't necessarily in this building and is that part of what what you're planning on doing as well through the chair there will be a lot we've kind of given you the broad strokes of the consultation process but obviously the information that's collected through each one of these steps will influence how the rest of the conversation proceeds so for example in the, the what we were discussing earlier that it should for at 8 Ontario Street North not emerge as an option or a good option for an arts hub we'll have to kind of figure out at that point how we either continue the conversation about arts hub that's not at that space um, because it made the the process we've outlined here may not be appropriate for that discussion. So there is some iteration in this process. Okay. The the other thing, um, and just sort of following up on the qu issue of timing, um, and, and I share some of the concerns in terms of how long this is uh, spreading out. I get summer isn't the, the best time, but on the other hand, I also recognize that throughout the city, uh, we have a variety of special events and festivals that literally bring thousands of people together from all different parts of the city. And, you know, I know we did that with our neighborhood strategy as an example. We set up booths and interacted with the public and, and got feedback from all different neighborhoods. So I'm wondering if, in fact, you can put some of that September, October stuff into the summer time frame, you know, maybe extend into third week of September but that would at least, you know, tie it, tighten it up and, and have it done by the end of September at least, as opposed to end of October mm -hmm. um, as a way. So maybe that's something staff can go back and look at. Through the chair, we can adjust the schedule in that way, and that's a good opportunity with uh, a lot of people downtown even to um, get more feedback uh, from the public with regard to the building tours at that time too. Okay, great. So I see staff is taking a lot of suggestions through the questions from the committee. Uh, this would be coming back to council for ratification, correct? So would the would it be a revised report reflective of the comments received through this? Or the suggestions being made, do you guys want it to be a, uh, kind of a direction given by the committee? Uh, through the chair, I will take direction based on the um, minutes and direction in the that we get from today, and then we don't have to bring the report back. I don't think. Go to Mr. Wilmer as well. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I would agree that, that, that we can take this as direction. I think maybe the one exception to that is the question that Councillor Galloway Seelock raised about whether we split option one and consult separately with the community on whether or not the community agrees that the funding from the potential sale be directed to the Arts Hub. Uh, that's not what we've recommended, and I think it was deliberate on staff's part that uh, for reasons set out in the report we've heard uh, through many forums for many years that there's a there's a strong demand in the arts community for this and I think what we're recommending is that council um, make that commitment now that each of these three options leads to an arts hub and that they're we're not really asking the community do you want an arts hub or not it's really about uh, how where would it be how would it be operated and managed so um, I think that is something we would look for a specific uh, resolution from council and um, as we've heard concerns about timing I think that extra question would probably add time to the uh, the uh, overall consultation okay um, I'll go back to so we clarify this point I'll go back to uh, council um, C lock can you can you so that's fine. So were you interested in wanting to kind of explicitly articulate the difference between uh, the beginning of option one or? Um, uh, yeah, I uh, do. Um, and I'm, I'm opening to having that vote, uh, uh, this committee to, to make that vote, whether or not to separate them. Um, from my perspective, there's people who don't want a arts hub period and they need a place to say that. And we don't currently give them no. an option. 
that's that's fine. I think we're already cl clear with that. But the further to your initial point, you also said for the disposition of the sale of the property for those proceeds to be used for dot dot dot. Do you have something in mind? You no, want no, no, the monies no. to go into general provisions? No. You want it to sit in a reserve or? No, um, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not making that determination of where that funding would go. I'm just asking for the question through the community engagement to be separate. If we sold the property, do you want those proceeds to go towards the arts hub? Okay. People can answer yes, and they can answer no. And then, with, um, okay. and, and then we can deal with that um, if if that comes forward. Um, but there needs to be a place where somebody can say, I don't want any of these options, and we currently don't give that. And so I'm not saying for me that that's where my head is at, but I right. think it's important for us to separate the two, sell the property, and if we sell the property, where does the funding That's go? fine. I think so we're, just we're clear with that, so I'll, I'll, I will take that as an amendment to that direction. And I don't know if you want to write it or not. I don't think it's necessary. You're just wanting to divide option one. So uh, when the time is right, I will take that. So uh, back to council. So again, to committee members, if you feel that you're suggesting something that is outside the scope of the staff recommendation, then that's not a suge suggestion. That's more of a direction. Then you may want to articulate if you want to forward that as a, an amendment. Councillor Ethington. Well, first off, Mr. Chair, I've got a couple of questions, but I just quickly say what I've just heard would completely undermine this whole process. I'm not going to take comments on it. You'll have opportunity later. Well, you've later taken point. comments already, Mr. No, Chair. I was asking for clarification, Councillor, so please, if you want to ask questions of staff, and there are delegations as well, so we want to be respectful of that. The questions of staff, uh, you've already talked so that two uh, advisory committees, and I know that some people have already toured the building. We've already been asked what the general impression was. From a general impression point of view, what did you hear from the advisory committees? And is that reflected in these options? Through the chair, uh, from the point of view of the options, they uh, emerged quite naturally from uh, the various committees. Um, so they seem to have hit the spectrum, although there may be an option that's not in there that's a start to the conversation. We uh, got feedback uh, from the advisory committees that is reflected here in terms of the heritage Kitchener, talking about the preservation as a, as a high priority, in terms of downtown vitality, uh, and also where the uh, arts community could imagine the, the potential activities that were needed before and after the prospect of this report. And finally, from the point of view of downtown development, we also got some feedback on the potential of the space on that street. Thank you. And one other quick question. When you do your tours of the building, you would be restricted on how many people you can take on such a tour, am I correct? Through the chair, we're working with facilities management and security in order to make the tours safe. They would have to be yeah. small numbers during broad daylight. Uh, there's minimal lighting, no washrooms. And so for <coughs> us, it would, I don't know the precise number, but uh, similar to when we brought council or the media through, uh, 10, 12 at a time. Yeah. And how will people know about those tours? Through the chair. We anticipate doing a bunch of social media marketing and then right. also using our networks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Thank you. Have any other alternative, alternative locations been identified as a potential hub? Uh, through the chair, uh, specific locations for an arts hub have not yet been explored, although uh, ideas have sprung from the uh, discussions around 44 Gockel and uh, in terms of city-owned properties um, unless there's uh, others that have ideas where there's currently not a, a lot of proposals for the kinds of uses that we've heard about on city properties okay, so we'll, we'll pardon me will we be taking that as uh, part of the engagement feedback if, if people are suggesting alternative locations through the chair yes okay uh, the other Part that really concerns me about the engagement is the like I know there is no firm costing but there's a complete lack of costing um, so when I look at option number two it's mm -hmm. develop an, R, an RFP lease the property so the property 
is in, while it's in structurally good shape, it's in dire need of renovation. So we would have to put significant leasehold improvements in that. Do we have an idea of what that might be? Uh, through the chair, it, it, we do have uh, an idea of the premature requirements to bring it up to building codes such as uh, elevator and roof and uh, washrooms. Uh, specific uh, costs and analysis for what the building requires will be uh, conducted in order to uh, proceed with some of those uh, um, option discussions in those groups. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit early to figure out exactly how much that would cost, but I imagine uh, facilities management and finance could help us with those. That said, the costs may or may not be uh, borne by the city as the proponent will probably be, need to meet criteria for uh, raising funds for some of the renovations. Okay. But so I guess my concern then is there's no real way when you're doing this engagement for the public to weigh in on which is the most cost-effective option? Through the chair, we imagine that if you look in the September-October portion of the process, by the time we're getting to charrettes, and then between charrettes and world cafes, we're actually really articulating what the possible model would be. So at that point, we can do a more fulsome financial analysis to determine how it might operate. And so the reason that we've done it that way is we wanted to get the community feedback, what are the needs to be met in the space, and then do a more detailed analysis of how it might operate both financially and uh, organizationally. So they will have a, an option, an opportunity to comment, yes. Comment on that, okay, good. Um, my last question, and it was along the lines of uh, Councillor Gallery Sealock's uh, first question, is in, in the engagement in general. And I'm going to come back to this because I have a sense that it's going to come back to Council very clearly as option number two. Um, and my concern in that is we, how are you going to balance the vested interest? For example, and I. I it, Whenever we do this sort of engagement, what happens in this specific example is if you talk to the arts community, they're going to say, they're going to see, here's a concrete example. We're going to say yes, or it might be nothing. If you talk to the heritage community, they're going to say it's a heritage building. If the city owns it, it has a much better chance of being protected. And if that makes up the bulk of the response, that's not representative of the community, in my opinion, and makes the decision for me difficult. So I'm asking the question now, and you may not have the answer now, because I know you're still fleshing out some of the examples. But how can I be assured when this engagement comes back that it's reflective of the broader community and not just those that have a vested interest? Through the chair, we're looking to engage the community as broadly as we can. It's true that there is a specific uh, view from the arts community and heritage community. Hopefully we can be inclusive. And finally, the uh, consultation will be brought back to council to make the decision. And that information will, will be helping council to decide. Okay, thank you. Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Singh. Uh, thank you for this report and all that's gone into it. I, I know we've heard a lot about the need for affordable performance, rehearsal, and creation space. Uh, I'm just wondering if once th these options are, are developed a bit more, uh, if we can address the uh, ability to make uh, things affordable in each of these options. Because I think it, it would differ depending on which option was chosen. Through the chair, yes. It, the, the affordability, we would imagine, would be different depending on the options selected. And we and plan on, during, during the engagement, to assess what affordability means and how best the community feels like it could be achieved. Okay. Because to, to me, I think uh, the affordability is, is key in this. And uh, I have no doubt that our arts community can coexist and collaborate well in this. But affordability is really key. Thank you. Um, just going to round two, um, Mayor Vavanovich had some questions, but I'm going to quickly ask mine before we get to round two. Um, so I see the uh, art sub really married with the uh, consideration what do we do with our city owned building at 48 uh, Ontario Street. So through your presentation and comments, you uh, really focused on Waterloo Region, the arts community within the Waterloo Region. Mm -hmm. Why are we taking this up on as a uh, arts hub as opposed to the region of Waterloo perhaps taking on that mandate when whatever facility it's really built will not only serve the residents of Kitchener, although they will be explicitly paying for it,
but it will be uh, wider serving to the entire regional um, constituency or residents. Through so why, why are we not lobbying to the region as opposed to us really uh, taking a charge on this on our own? Mm -hmm. uh, through the chair, you know, depending on the kind of models that emerge, I think those funding models, should they serve beyond uh, the city of Kitchener, would include uh, exploration of exactly how that would be funded at municipally with partnerships, as we've done in other cases, provincially and federally. For, and you're, when you're saying funding, you're saying, I should time myself, my apologies. I should be fair as I am to everyone else. <laughs> um, uh, so when you say funding, you're saying the, the actual creation, the cost to create, if it ends up being at interior street property, uh, the, whatever the cost will be to remediate the property as well. And going forward, the leasing cost also? Uh, through the chair, it may be premature to speculate. <laughs> I mean, through you, Chair Singh, to speculate on the operation side. I think the immediate challenge will be uh, what minimum work needs to be invested in order to make, should it not be sold, in order to make the uh, building meet building code and accessibility. Okay. So, so I'll ask uh, one more question, but mm -hmm. it's related to my first one, too. Part of this question, is it entirely for the purpose of us making a decision on 48 Ontario Street, or is it also asking the question, is there interest in the community for Arts Hub? Uh, through the chair, we expect uh, those uh, ideas to emerge, and through exploration, possibly those that we have not yet considered. So should that be asked as part of that first question of, do we want an Arts Hub? Should the city of Kitchener uh, facilitate our Arts Hub? Through the chair, we feel like the consultation done to date has clearly indicated the need for affordable space for arts and culture and creative industries. So whether or not we call it affordable space or a creative hub, which maybe could be further refined during this process, we feel that the stakeholder community has given us clear direction that this kind of affordable space and networking space and support is needed. Sure, that's because we're offering as opposed to, again, that was consultation with the stakeholder community as opposed to the the community at large, correct? That's correct. Okay, all right. Um, Mayor Rivenovich, go ahead. Well, thank you, and, and I guess that's partially where I was was going with that because uh, it was really building on, on Councillor Singh's uh, last comment or question um, because the reality is that, I mean, I, I believe that we need the space, just to be absolutely clear. Um, what the what the right solution is, I think there's an, this is certainly one way of doing it, and there's some others to pursue as as well potentially. Um, and this is why hearing from the community is important. But I, I do think that if we're going to see this happen, we need to ask the broader community the question around: Do they feel that? there's a need for it because the broader community is ultimately going to need to buy in and support this, um, not just the stakeholder community. And, and so I, I think that we need to figure out how to ask that question as part of this consultation. Um, because, I mean, we've seen where, you know, in, historically where groups have made a case and in fact, you know, I, I think of, I'll go back to the Poseidon project as an example where the School of Pharmacy now sits, and it was a, a, you know, a, a national swim complex and so on, and, and there was lots of arguments to do it, but nobody brought the community along with it at the time, and, and there wasn't community buy-in, and it fizzled. And so I guess what I'm saying is, it's not enough to just have stakeholder buy-in, and so we need to make sure that we, 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 we understand where the community sits on this issue. Um, and then the, the other question then to go with that um, is assuming that the buy-in is there for the, uh, for the Arts Hub. Um, I just want to be absolutely clear on the question that um, Councillor Davey asked. Um, will we ask the question of, you know, do you think 48 is the right place for it, or do you have other suggestions? Like, will that be a specific question we'll ask? Through the chair, I'm not sure that it'll be a specific question. It, it could be, but I think the whole point of the process is deter to determine whether the needs that have been articulated by the community for affordable space and some of the other things that we've described can be met in 48 Ontario Street North. So if the answer to that question is no, it's not the right fit, then we'll change tax. 
Right. I, I guess I, I want to hear that because I already know I've heard from pe other people in the community who think that other locations may be more suited for mm -hmm. an arts hub mm -hmm. um, rather than, than that one. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we, we don't, just to be very clear, that doesn't mean we don't need to uh, preserve that building, that, mm -hmm. that it's not an important mm -hmm. heritage building. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about Arts Hub in that building, and is that the best place for it? That's, yeah. I want to make sure that that's clearly understood. Yes. So the short answer is yes, we'll ask that. Okay. All right. So that was all the question for, for staff as part of the present. Do you have? Oh. No, you just did now. Uh, Councillor Ioannidis. Mine's comments. Oh, I see. Okay. Councillor Marsh. As part of your consultation, uh, so far, the way you've described it, you know, uh, the, it, I think that maybe because uh, you are immersed in, in uh, the topic, uh, you have a strong sense of what an arts hub is. But uh, I think it will be useful if you can help define for the wider community uh, what is an arts hub, what is what what is an so an, what is an arts hub, what it is, what it is not, and then also of course what could, what what it could be because it's all going to depend on the context within our community. You know what would our arts hub look like? It's not going to look like any other arts hub. So uh, I, I encourage you to, uh, to, to define that more clearly. Also, uh, the 48 Ontario has its limitations, and we've already heard you know, about some of those li limitations. It's never going to be a, a state-of-the-art theater space, ever, no matter what you do to it. And so, uh, so it's not really going to compete with purpose-built theater spaces. Uh, yeah. So, so it's, it's important, I think, for you to flush that out a little bit and, and, but, and also to flush out what are the opportunities at 48 Ontario. So, uh, you know, I, I'm hearing around the horseshoe a few comments about, you know, we've got to ask the community what they want, whether they think we should have an arts hub, but uh, I think that we have asked for, according, you know, to, uh, to what you said earlier, Culture Plan 1, Culture Plan 2, for 20 years, uh, we've heard from the community that we need to support a strong arts and culture community. And so I wonder if you could revisit some of the thousands of comments that you... I'm not asking you to delve into data of thousands of comments. I'm asking you to just look at... Uh, what have you heard about the needs in the community uh, and, and for you to decide on the scope of that? But I'm just asking you to look at, is there a better way to articulate what we've heard from the community and help, to help people come along as to why, why on earth are we coming up with this silly arts hub? I mean, it's not just out of the sky. Uh, you know, 20 artists have said that we needed it and so we're going to create it. It's not that, right? And so it's thousands and thousands of community members have come forward and maybe in different ways said, said what they need. And I think you know that, uh, but I don't think that it's clear yet. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, part of the exploration will be to define Arts Hub as far as what it means through the community, but also to note, uh, especially through Make It Kitchener, uh, but along the way is what we've discovered, this is about building the industry, and the creative industries uh, have their uh, interest as part of the labor force, similar to the work that we've done in Make It Kitchener, and the kind of catalyst investments and strategic direction that we've taken for other industries is what we're doing here. It's not particularly um, that it can't all be met in one space. It may be decentralized. We hear a lot about centralized working to uh, act as a catalyst, similar to the way it has in the technology industry. It's, as it states in the report, generally project-based work and therefore having an opportunity to network with each other to find it, the expertise grows the industry. And that actually sparks the rest of innovation. Even the Martin Prosperity Institute shows that communities with an active and vibrant, as Richard Florida had said in his last visit here, uh, th that kind of vibrant scene actually sparks innovation across other sectors up to and including the manufacturing and design. Um, so this is, is 
you know, goes into what we've been hearing for 20 years, overlaps what we've been hearing from the community, from the economic side, and thirdly, how it actually feeds innovation across all the sectors. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, those are the questions to staff and as, as a delegation. Uh, Councillor uh, Etherington, comments? Again, we have delegations. Just to the committee, I did this a little bit differently. Uh, typically, we have staff presenting, but this was a bit more uh, in-depth presentation, and then we go to other delegations as well, and then come back to staff. I did it this way that, because I presume there was a lot of questions of staff to begin with, and I wanted that to be weeded out when we finally get to uh, our delegations as well. So now, finally, we'll get to our delegations, and I uh, appreciate the patience uh, for you sitting, and hopefully the questions that was asked of staff was informative for you as well as you bring forward and um, present to committee. Uh, so the first presenter is Mr. Marskell. Uh, please come forward. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm very de delighted that staff is uh, looking to invest into the arts. Um, I would just pick on the words a little bit. I think it's an artist hub as opposed to an arts hub. Um, I'm very much a believer that uh, a critical mass is important, especially in downtown Kitchener, to bring the various arts groups together. You've got our museum, the theater next door. This is certainly something for you to look into. Um, we're very, um, I'm very excited about it. I would, um, and, and many of the questions have been dealt here, so I'll go very, very quickly. I, I would just urge that you not make an ad hoc decision um, because I think there is a much larger strategy in play here and, and a, a much larger vision that could impact um, the whole downtown core and a number of organizations. I really hope that you would ask how this decision could positively impact KWAG or the symphony or the museum because I think they're a part of this conversation. Um, and an isolated decision could lead to another arts group underfunded and unsustainable uh, and that's uh, I think the last thing we need um, that's really it the museum has five overarching strategies to become the cultural hub of southwestern Ontario as stated you've seen it here and it's certainly stated on our website uh, we have certain metrics for that attendance out-of-town media out-of-town visitors and so on and um, we take a world reaching view at what we attempt to do and I know that uh, your decision will be a good one to help us get there thank you Thank you. Um, can I have Ms. Algie come forward? Again, you have five minutes. I should have said that to David as well. You have five minutes to make your presentation. Sure. My name is Kay Algie. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of myself today. <laughs> um, but I am really happy to see that the city is looking to use this building because um, it's a really important building, and as we know, empty heritage buildings are in danger of demolition by neglect. So I've been working with James Howe to get this as a doors open site, and, and thanks to the cooperation and huge work from Jim Edmondson from the city who talked to dozens of people, and also Carl Kessler, the doors open coordinator. As you've heard, it will be open to the public on September the 17th. So in terms of the proposal that we're looking at today, I'd like to speak in support of option two, the city retaining the building. I might not have said this a year ago, but I do think the city has really worked hard to come up with um, heritage best practices. And, and I think that, that it's, it's already implemented a number of things that show that, that it will exercise good stewardship. And I think it's good for the city, the taxpayers, to be able to reap some of the, the benefits of having kept the building open so long. So, so let's turn it around and, and, and make some money out of it ourselves. Um, but the point that concerns me a bit, and a number of you have alluded to this, I think there really are two questions here. Number one is, what are we gonna do with 48 Ontario Street North? And number two, how are we going to get an arts hub that people in this city want if we want an arts hub? So it's like the arts hub and there's 48 Ontario Street North. Now, if it turns out that, that those mesh, then it's a win-win situation. But um, I think they, they need to be looked at separately. From my point of view, I think the important thing is to retain and adaptively reuse the building. And, um, and 
I think there, there could be um, other ways to do this. I, I would prefer the, the city looked at that separately, left its options open. Maybe it could become part of Leon Arts Hub, maybe it could lease out some of the other space. And alternatively, I think, as, as a number of you have said, the question of the Arts Hub deserves some, some investigation on its own. But all in all, I mean, it's really exciting to be here talking about what's going to happen with 48 Ontario Street North and also looking at an Arts Hub. So both things are great. I just would prefer if, if they were separated out. Thank you. So um, we have made our questions of, uh, of staff. Um, do I have a move? Oh, I think Councillor Marsh, you said you wanted to move it? Okay. It's been moved by Councillor Marsh, and I'll open it up to uh, comments. Mayor Vanovich. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I will uh, be supporting the, the recommendation in front of us along with uh, all of the input that I think various members of council have, uh, have made uh, around how the uh, process um, needs to be adjusted in order to, to make sure we, we get the, the, f the full breadth of, of understanding that we're hoping for out of the, the community consultation. I believe there's, there, there is, as the last delegation pointed out, really two issues here. One is, you know, the future of 48 Ontario, and one is the, the hub. And um, while, while in my mind both of those, um, you know, need to be looked at and, and, and addressed, and uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, we, we maintain and, and, uh, the, the existing building, um, and, and its historical aspects. I think we also want to make sure that uh, we're going forward with a hub. It's something that's going to meet the needs of the, the community uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. I think we also need to be open to, to a variety of, of ideas that might come forward. I mean, I remember sitting around a previous horseshoe where um, we thought the right answer for the center block and so on was to build the, the central library um, on that block. And, and it made sense for a whole number of reasons. Um, but the community actually came back and said, slow down, no, we actually like the building we're in and we'd like you to go back and figure out how to do a, a comprehensive um, uh, overhaul of, of that building um, and because it, it has a lot of uh, qualities that, that, that we value. And so, you know, we may get some of that coming through this process um, as we look for ultimately the, 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 where we need to have a hub. I'm, um, I'm more than happy to, uh, to be a strong advocate uh, for, for the hub process, for, for, the, for the need of a hub uh, in terms of building the, the, the creative uh, scene in, uh, in Kitchener. Um, but we need to hear from the community and make sure the community comes along with us as part of that process. And I think this consultation will, uh, will allow that to happen. It's, it's going to be great. We've got Engage KW now, our new software package, which does give people a lot of freedom to, uh, to do it when it's convenient. They can do it at night. They can do it on the weekend. They can do it from, you know, they're going to their cottage up on, uh, on Lake Huron. They can do it from there. Um, and, uh, and so I think some of our traditional timing concerns may be not a factor anymore as they have been in the past. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the next number of months, the input we're going to get, and ultimately uh, the directions uh, that we're going to go with this. Thank you. Councillor Ioannidis. Thank you, Chair Singh. Um, I think it's been pretty clear that this property is, uh, it resonates really, uh, <coughs> really deep in our community. And uh, I'm going to support the recommendation, but personally, I don't, I, I don't want to see this, this property leave city hands. I think we need to walk the talk. We've been talking about, you know, um, heritage buildings. Um, I think they should be owned by the city. I think, uh, I think we, we put a lot of restrictions on, on private individuals, and I, I think we should be able to do the same on ourselves and not just sell the property to someone else and then impose those restrictions on them. So um, with that, I think as far as the Arts Hub, I think... Uh, I think with this community, with the community engagement, I think it'll be pretty again crystal clear from all the other pro, all the other community engagements that there is an arts hub. But what I really hope we can see is get a little definitive answer of what people want in this property to see, because I I personally do not want to see it sold. 
Thank you. Councilor Fernandez. So I think one of the pieces as I was listening to everybody that maybe I should have asked um, our staff is to divine what an arts hub is. What does that, what does that mean? You know, is it a variety of uh, performance, performers? Is it physical um, art like painting, pottery? Is it written word? Is it music? So I think that that's one of the things that might be missing, and I apologize that I didn't ask that question, but it was really just in listening to what everybody else was saying that it sort of came to that, um, to that conclusion. And, you know, I don't know if it's too late in the game, but maybe that should be what one of your opening statements is, is what do you see um, as an arts hub, or should we call it a performance space? I think we really have to have an understanding what that's going to be. I'm always supportive of preserving heritage. Um, how that looks and what does that mean and, and what's the cost going to be is another whole other component to, to this discussion. And uh, you know, if we find out that through this engagement that people are saying, well, it's, it's a lovely old building, but I would never want to perform in there or I would never want to practice in there or I would never want to do cultural activities in there, then we're still stuck holding on to a building, we have to find a purpose for that. So I think that that's uh, a, a maybe another spin-off to all of these discussions. Um, what if, if not this, then what? And at what cost? And where does that funding come from? It also has to fit together. So, you know, can musicians work together with people who are doing poetry? Uh, you know, do they want the quiet space? Uh, can an artist who's using different mediums uh, want to have a certain kind of light? I mean, all of that hopefully will come out of your discussions and your engagement. So it, it'll be very interesting to see how the next steps move forward and what the community says. I'm hoping that you have a wonderful response and it's not just from the converted who I know some are sitting here and some are probably listening. Um, I know that we all have our passions and we all have something that we really, really want. And I know for some of you, this is what you really, really want, but I think we also have to take a look at what the rest of the community wants too. Thank you. Councillor Ellington. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, I'd remind council that, <clears throat> excuse me, this involves only permission to move ahead with uh, community engagement to measure support for one of these various options. It's not for approval of any of those options. I would absolutely support that type of community engagement and because I very much believe we should preserve a few remaining heritage buildings, I would support it. When it comes to the time, I would support option two. I want to preserve the Legion building and retain the ownership, city ownership, and lease it out as a, an arts and culture center. I'm convinced that to do so would provide an excellent ongoing addition to the downtown and a valuable resource that would uh, increase the vibrancy of our core. I'd be very much against selling the heritage building and doubt that any developer would be interested in buying a heritage building and leasing it back to the city in the form of a, in any form of arts and culture use. Um, the only other comment I would make is that uh, <coughs> I think other cities have already experienced the economic vitality and spin-off advantages, some of them economic, to having a bustling arts community in uh, municipal cause, and we have the opportunity to do exactly that, to do the same probably in a much better way. And Mr. Chair, I would ask you, I had a comment on the amendment, should I make that now? Or yes, sure. yeah. My comment on the amendment is that uh, this uh, proposed amendment would be a leading question 
And the whole point of this exercise is to get some type of uh, some type of answer on this arts culture question. People are not stupid. They're able to uh, differentiate between these options and what we're talking about. And I think it's up to this council to have the gumption to establish some form of center and not undermine that intent. We've been looking at this, has been said, for 20 years. We're on this council to make the tough, right decisions and I'm not interested in avoiding or finding a way, a political way out of that difficult decision. I would like the options to stay the <coughs> way they are, and I'll be voting against that amendment. Thank you. Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Singh. Uh, I am in support of this recommendation because it's proceeding with community and stakeholder engagement on, on a range of options. Uh, this building has heritage in its physical form and inside with music. It was the birth of, of Pop the Gator, uh, an arts hub. We want this, but we do want to get it right for our arts community and for our community overall. Uh, I agree with Councillor Etherington. If we own 48 Ontario, we, we control the building, its physical heritage, and the affordability inside. It would be great to have an arts hub that's downtown where music can be created and then performed in our, uh, in our clubs downtown where film could be created and played at the Apollo Cinema. Uh, arts add to the vibrancy of our city and our citizens and to have an arts hub with that space that encourages creation, collaboration, uh, where it can be rehearsed, where it can be performed, would be a huge benefit. We just have to get it right. Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair Singh. I've uh, put some thought into this, and I, I, I'm going to support uh, the amendment, but I'm not actually going to support the main motion. Um, I do have a week until Council to, to think about it, but uh, my concerns, I, I guess I'll list them out. I mean... I have the sense that it's almost a foregone conclusion that option number two is going to come back, and I guess that's what, what worries me the most. So first I want to deal with 48 Ontario Street and the heritage aspect. I agree with uh, my fellow members of council, absolutely it's a heritage building and absolutely it should be protected, and frankly I don't even understand why it's not designated now, it's only listed, it should be designated. What I don't agree with is the notion that actually concerns me that, uh, reading between the lines, that the heritage building is at risk unless it's under government ownership. I, I don't believe that and I think it's a scary prospect for uh, the residents and taxpayers in the city of Kitchener. We've, I've been in several heritage buildings that were under private ownership that were very well maintained and, uh, and I don't see why 40 Ontario should be any different. On to the, the art side of it. Do we need a hub? I think there's still some confusion between hub and performing arts space. My understanding is more the performing arts space than and the hub idea, I think that's an absolute need. I, I, I get that. We've, we've heard it time and time again. I don't think we even need to add, ask the question of the broader community because it's, it is a need. The question is whether this is the right space, whether it's the most affordable option, whether it's what the community really needs at 48 Ontario. And I don't think that this engagement is putting all the options on the table. I do have concerns, for example, that the center in the square has a studio space that's larger than the registry th theater that's criminally underutilized because it's too expensive to run, so it remains dark much of the time. That I get that there's factors in there that are beyond our control in some sense, but I think we need to go back to the, the, the community is going to accept that. At the same time, I also, we ha in terms of arts investment, I've said before, I've said in the past, and I'll say it again, I'm comfortable as a member of council having Kitchener among the leaders in two-tier municipalities in terms of dollar per capita funding for arts and culture. I've said it before and I'm, I'm sticking to that. Unfortunately, we don't have clear numbers on that and where we are, but my sense is that we are among the leaders already. Just this past budget, we've committed an extra $600,000 to the center in the square. Uh, 350 of that is permanent, 250 is transitional, but we're not sure how long that's gonna last. We know the KW Symphony isn't exactly in the strongest financial shape. We heard from 
uh, Mr. Marskell from the museum that uh, obviously the museum is, is struggling, is underfunded. We know the KWR gallery, when, uh, whenever we see a presentation there, they're concerned about costs and funding. And I have very serious concerns about the prospect of opening a new arts-related cultural space when I don't, I'm not completely confident in our ability to fund the ones that we have going forward. So I think we need more clear options, and I think we need an alternative option on the table uh, before I move forward with this. Uh, so as I said, I'm, I'm going to consider it between now and the next council meeting, but uh, at this point, I won't be able to support it. Councilor galloway Luck. Yeah, I want to say that on principle, I support the majority of what's moving forward. Is there no way that the implication that I'm trying to find a political way out have any fact behind it? We need to look at this holistically. And if we're going to the community, we need to look at it from a perspective of answering these questions. But there's nowhere in anything that we've done leading to this point that says that the funds from 48, if, if we sell, I need to clear, if we decide to sell, which I'm not even sold that's where I'm going, if we sell, that the proceeds of that need to go to the arts, uh, arts Hub. Politically, what we need to do if and when we are all convinced that the Arts Hub is needed in the community, which I've sat on the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee for a number of years, and I've heard it through Culture Plan 1 and Culture Plan 2, so I know the need is there, then politically we need to make it happen whether or not we sell this building or not, and we need to find the money to do it. It doesn't mean that 48, the proceeds of 48 Ontario Street, if we sell it, need to go towards this project. I also am not going to sit here and say that that building is suited for the arts community, because maybe it's not, and that's why we need this process. Because why are we going to spend money and put it into a building that doesn't meet their needs? That's why we need to figure out, does this actually work? So I'm not going to give my opinion on what it is. I've heard from the community that we need an arts hub, but we've linked these two together somehow, and I agree that we probably should have kept them separate. But we're moving forward. I'm looking forward to hearing back from the consultation about what we need in our arts hub and what we're going to do with 48 Ontario Street. And therefore, that's why I'm bringing my amendment forward to just say, uh, take out the second part of option number one and just leave it at uh, the development, basically to sell it, but through the public consultation, ask the community, should we use those proceeds if we sell it to go towards this art, arts hub? And I don't think that that's any finding a political way out. I think it's asking a good question of the community, trying to do it all at once. And I think politically, we'll find a way out if we want to, but we'll also find a way to do it if we really want to do it. I'm totally supportive of moving forward with this public consultation and um, I think that if we're going to have an arts hub, there may be other strategic properties or other funding mechanisms we can find to do that. It doesn't have to be tied to 48 Ontario Street. That's why I'm bringing my amendment forward. I've written it out. It might help people. It might not. <laughs> and again, the amendment is breaking option one into two parts. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Go ahead. So if you just look at option number one, it would, it would have the first two sentences and take out the with the proceeds of said um, sale to be held in reserve. That would be what option one is. And then the second piece of what the amendment is is basically just direction to ask, tell staff to ask that question through the consultation period. So I wouldn't put that as part of option one. It's more of a question for staff to ask, which picks up that piece there. So, so it's an additional question. It's an, it's, an a question, it's an additional question that they would ask, but it also cuts off half of option one um, right. in the recommendation. Okay, good. Councillor Marsh. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, if I may, if the chair allows, I want to ask Councillor Gallagher Seelock a question just about her amendment. Um, so, mm -hmm. if we did remove that second clause in option one, uh, and just left it open, um, don't you think that it would uh, leave the question of whether or not the city is going to support an arts hub in the end uh, up 
up for debate, that we, we would end up having the debate about an arts hub, yes or no, rather than uh, whether or not the arts hub should be tied to 48 Ontario. We're going to have that debate regardless when this report comes back, whether or not we need an arts hub and how it's going to be funded. If it comes back, we need an arts hub. We're going to have to determine how to fund it if we decide at that time as a council that that, so that debate's going to happen regardless. Mm -hmm. I just think it's more input from the community. Do we use these proceeds if we sell it or do we, we find a different way? So I don't think it negates the debate at all. So are you worried that if we keep the, uh, the clause that you're asking to take out, that, that that would box us in too much, that it would then be a, a done deal that, okay, we have to use the proceeds? No, I'm worried it, that, that it's a key assumption that if we sell it, that then the proceeds have to go to that. So I guess you could say boxing in, but it doesn't give anybody in the community an option to say no. So it, it basically, if, if, if these were the only options that I was presented as the community member, mm -hmm. and I didn't want any of them, I, I don't have an option out. So this gives them an opportunity to say option one, sell it, but I also don't want an arts hub because I don't want the proceeds to go to that. Yeah. But um, so it's, it, I guess okay. it, I'm, I'm trying to, and I think I've said it two or three times, that's not my opinion that we I understand. don't need an arts yeah. hub. No, I understand but I'm just saying. trying to make it a holistic okay. public consultation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm just going to continue with a couple comments. Uh, just to say uh, that as, as it stands, uh, I unfortunately will not be able to support the amendment um, because I, I do feel that... Um, it's uh, whether or not we're going to debate the question of an arts hub uh, later down the road. I am confident that the style of consultation that staff is going forward with is very much qualitative, including the online survey. It provides an option for comments, and I feel I feel <laughs> confident that the community members who are against an arts hub outright would be able to provide that feedback in the form of comment or in the form of conversation or in the form of dialogue in a stakeholder lab or anything else. So, um, so that's why I, I do think that we need to demonstrate in this initiative that we are interested to support uh, the arts community one way or another. Okay, thank you. Uh, everyone's made their comments. I'll quickly make mine. Um, I will be supportive of the amendment because I think it does give more options. We can't, uh, you know, give limiting options to, our, you know, uh, our citizens, and especially because we're not only posing this question to our stakeholders community within the arts that are vested and well aware of what the issues at hand are. Uh, this question is to the average homeowner that may not be as uh, explicitly aware of, of, of what the discussion at hand may be, but takes uh, interest at a later point, and those options need to be more clear uh, as to what we want to do uh, with the, uh, the, the property. And I think that's, that's where the issue for me has really uh, been from the onset, that I think we too quickly married these two options together, and we've continued to run with it. Uh, and, you know, I, I hold a lot of uh, high regard with uh, staff approach and the recommendations that staff do put forward. But uh, I'm reluctant to say on this one, uh, I think we got the approach backward. Uh, sometimes we get excited with an idea and we begin to run with it. And uh, unfortunately, we need to tie our shoes. Otherwise, we will, we will st stumble at a later point. And I think the way we're doing it right now, there is a risk of stumbling. We should have properly outline the parameters of what an arts hub is. What that arts hub would look like, what the partners of the heart, uh, arts hub would be, um, what role would the city of Kitchener take in that heart, uh, arts hub, uh, what the cost implications of that, what that arts hub would be to our taxpayers. And once those guidelines were uh, properly weeded through and our citizens had the right uh, opportunity to make that decision and that that is the direction that we wanted to go with and that matter was to rest then we should have looked out and said okay our community wants an arts hub they want us to take the charge be a leader at this not the region not any other agency 
but the city of Kitchener. That's defined. Now, where do we look for it? Wait a minute. We have a building. It's a heritage building that may be an appropriate use, and that posed that question. And because we properly defined what an arts hub is, the funding, the costing of it, then we would have been better able to articulate when we pose this question, if you want to do it at, at 48 Ontario, it's going to cost this and this. And that would have allowed our citizens to see if that is the right place for us to be doing it, for us to be investing the right amounts of money in that place to be doing it, or is there an alternative location that's more suited? But we did it backward. There is a lot of confusion related to this. Had I not been chairing, I probably would have been putting a deferral motion forward and said, no, we got to do this the right way. Let's define that. What is the rush? I agree. And, and this is more of a comment to our arts community, you know, the, uh, uh, members here that, that, that are involved with the, the arts community. This is not, my comments are not a reflection on if or should. It's more properly defining of what and where are we trying to get ourselves to. And what we're doing is a little bit convoluted. I will support it. Uh, I'm not sure where I will sit when uh, it will come back to council. But uh, at this point, I will support the, uh, the amendment and to get this to uh, council, support it at that point. I'd support it at this point, but uh, we'll redefine my comments through, uh, through council meeting uh, when this comes back. So with this recorded vote, uh, the amendment first. All those in favor? Opposed? And the amendment carries. And as amended, the recommendation. Moved by uh, Councillor Marsh. And this recorded vote as well, I'm assuming. All those in favor? Opposed? Can we redo it, please? That's okay. It happens. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries two. So again, this item uh, has only been approved through the committee and would need to be ratified through council. I think the committee really dwelled fairly deep into this and hopefully staff will be able to clarify going into our council meeting. And, uh, and at that point, then council will decide uh, ultimately, if this, uh, this motion that's being recommended by the committee would be ratified and we proceed forward as recommended by staff. So until then, 